So uh, welcome everyone today to Green Sunday. This is a monthly program put on by the Green Party of Alameda County. Um, today's topic is uh, Nicaragua, and we, we had another Nicaragua topic a few months back, and this is uh, in a way a, a follow-up to that or a response to that. And we were looking into it, and the Green Party doesn't have an official position on um, Nicaragua and affairs, you know, that country specifically, even though we do have, um, you know, positions on human rights and uh, a number of other things generally. So um, with with that said, um, welcome everyone, and I'll pass it over to Don, who will introduce uh, the topic uh, further and uh, today's panelists. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Don. Uh, for those that don't know me, which is almost nobody here, uh, I've been kicking around the local Green Party for quite a while. I'm a, uh, what they call a fixture. And I've also been a fixture around Nicaragua, Nicaragua solidarity. Not that I'm anybody important, I'm not. But I've been involved with Nicaragua things for about 40 years. Um, so, and I'm also one of the people that believes that the current administration in Nicaragua is dictatorial and repressive. This is all very personal for me. I, um, you know, I have friends and family and people uh, involved with Nicaragua, former comrades, revolutionaries, and, you know, people I care about. And I've lost people. I lost people back during the Contra War. One of those people I almost lost was myself. Uh, I came really close to getting killed in that war. I visit Nicaragua from time to time when I can and uh, stay in touch. One of the people I got in touch with recently was a guy named uh, Wilfredo Montes. Wilfredo Montes was my squad leader when I was in the militia. So Wilfredo and I had a talk, you know, they're talking decades after the war and the revolution and all. And he had a very strong opinion that fighting for the revolution also meant fighting for the conditions under which the Liberal Party could actually win elections. In other words, defeat the Sandinistas. And he felt, and I feel, and a lot of my fellow combatants from that period feel that the, um, that the freedoms that we brought in were one of the main promises we kept to the people or tried to keep to the people. Uh, we didn't promise much during the Contra War. We didn't promise much uh, in general, really, as a government. We were trying to do all kinds of things. And one of the goals was to never again have Nicaragua fall into repression. Uh, the Nicaragua of the Somoza period was a Nicaragua where you could be taken to a hill and shot for your opinions. Now, current government's not that, but it's not keeping that promise of having no repression either. Um, as somebody takes this very personally, and you know, considering the lives lost and the sacrifices made, uh, the risks taken, the work that went in to building the Nicaraguan revolution, to believe that the current government is repressive is not one something you want to believe. It just, you know, it, it, it's a nightmare come true. And I just certainly wouldn't believe it easily. I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't duly convinced, right? Now I know, and we're probably gonna hear about all the things the United States does. And I believe that. I believe that the State Department is an interventionist, imperialist enterprise. It works for American business and has for longer than any of us have been alive. And I have no doubt that they're up to their same dirty tricks and they're probably up to some tricks that we don't even know about. Can people hear? But that doesn't mean that what the United States does defines or excuses what the Daniel Ortega government is. One does not equate the other. Both problems could be true at the same time. The way I look at Nicaragua today is that we on the left, the solidarity movement, the progressives, and especially us Greens, are being challenged to um, understand 
that intervention in other countries is something that we oppose. And we just should oppose it blanketly. At the same time, we should not and um, never should turn away from the pe other peoples in the world who are suffering from repression. In Nicaragua, we have both of these things come to play. And I think that we should always be able to maintain a policy and an optic by which we understand the needs of other peoples. At the same time, we respect their national sovereignty and stay out of their internal affairs. Right now, we got two narratives on Nicaragua coming up among the left. Um, one of them seems to think that the current government, you know, it makes some minor mistakes, but their intentions are good and they're a great example for the revolution and the world and all that, and that all the problems in Nicaragua really can be laid at the feet of American intervention. Um, well, that's a, a view. The other narrative, and it's the one that I uh, agree with, is that what's happened is a government that once held the franchise in the name of the revolution, the name of the Frente Sandinista, has basically slipped into becoming a repressive government and that the, the situation there does have leftovers from a revolutionary period, but it is a uh, present is a dictatorial period and it's not Nicaragua's first. And it's a very sad uh, state of affairs. And I don't believe the Nicaraguan government is progressive. I think it keeps a name from the past. But a lot of this, it kind of depends on who you believe. Um, I'm sure that the other people who are not so closely connected to Nicaragua, you hear people who've been to Nicaragua, people that worked in Nicaragua, people who have long standing relations with Nicaragua are seeing different things. And who do you believe? It's, it's hard to uh, sort it out, especially since Nicaragua, frankly, is not one of the top issues in the world right now. There's more important things happening in places like Yemen and Ukraine. I personally, believe the people I trust. I have friends, I have family, um, long-standing contacts, and I don't think any of them have a reason to lie to me. When my friends in Nicaragua are afraid to talk in public because they're critical of the regime, that also tells me something. These are people that I never thought of, of ever beginning to be uh, careful about what they said in public. That is not the Nicaraguan way. Um, and there's overwhelming uh, lack of support for the Sandinista, the so-called Sandinista government of Daniel Ortega of today, uh, from the very people that fought the revolution with him. Uh, we're talking about the overwhelming majority of the original Sandinista cadre and leadership. You're talking about the overwhelming majority of Latin America's left. And they, sure, they're not in favor of US intervention, but they're not in favor of Danielle's uh, abuse either. Two of the people I trust are the next two people to speak. Uh, Mirna Santiago lived in Nicaragua in the 1980s. She's worked, she knows more about human rights in Nicaragua than I'll ever know. And uh, she has maintained contacts and links and whatnot over the entire period. She's probably one of the best informed people that we could find. And our second speaker, Diana Bone, has an equally deep and longstanding relationship with Nicaragua. Hers is more focused, and Diana, you'll, ex you'll disabuse me if I have this wrong, but I thought it was more focused on the solidarity movement and the uh, rural development, social development kind of things. Um, so we'll pass this on to Mirna. And after the three of us speak, we would like to have a discussion with y'all. Mirna. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to this, um, this afternoon um, sort of conversation about Nicaragua. I'm gonna be extremely brief because I wanna leave lots of room for questions and discussion because I I am presuming that that everybody has quite a bit of, of information um, already and I don't necessarily want to repeat it. I want to focus just make three very short points about 
um, what I see the more salient, uh, the more salient areas of what's changed in Nicaragua since uh, Daniel Ortega got reelected in 2006. And then that in some ways or another led to um, the uh, uprisings in 2018 and have become further um, uh, more difficult to deal with since um, 2018. Um, and that's one is the development of the one party state that uh, Ortega and his wife Murillo have been involved with since the election in 2006. Um, the strangulations of women's rights that have happened since the second election of Daniel Ortega. And then the third um, is this, is at, at the, the, the way in which the government has gone about um, carrying out policies that, that well, they use a very specific type of, of, of discourse of language, if you will, of being progressive and socialist and being on the left, um, um, still then being revolutionary, they, they, the work that they've done shows quite the opposite in, in a policy of repressing the left quite openly and cozying up in a variety of different ways towards various sectors of, of the Nicaraguan right. So on the one party state, um, that became uh, what allowed the uh, what allowed Daniel Ortega in, in, uh, to gain the presidency there after the 2016, um, uh, the first set of elections in 2016, has been, as you probably all know, the changing of the constitution um, so that you only need 30% of the vote to win the presidency. And Daniel and Murillo do continue to have about about that much, about 30% of the population um, is with them. So they know they can win um, elections because it is only, uh, they only need to make it to 30% uh, uh, to do that. And because they control the Congress by controlling the, the FSLN, the FSLN has the majority, um, they were able to pass this level of, of reform so that it, it becomes um, really a very, uh, uh, you know, nowhere near 50% to win the presidency. Um, at this point, the, the, the regime is very, very tightly controlled by, by uh, Rosario Murillo and, and Daniel Ortega. People, as, as Dan mentioned, people who had been, um, who has still stuck with, um, with Daniel through when, when he got reelected in, in 2006, um, have been peeling off little by little or have been peeled off, which is probably more accurate, little by little over the course of, of time from 2006 until today. Um, so that anyone that runs afoul of the, of the of who dissents or runs afoul of whatever the presidential couple wants to do um, is kicked out or gets blacklisted. And once they get kicked out of the party or once they get blacklisted, it means um, losing, losing their jobs. Uh, since 2018, it also means uh, the possibility of being obviously kicked out of, out of uh, Nicaragua and just lately since February, losing citizenship and um, being expelled from, uh, from, from the country. So there's quite a bit of banning of people um, going on. This also includes uh, remnants of the foreigners who are still in Nicaragua people from the, from the years of the revolution, 1979 to 1980, who are under um, extreme scrutiny. Uh, you probably all, all, all know that the, the, the government has been canceling um, NGOs at will. Uh, you probably make the argument that there were too many NGOs to begin with in Nicaragua for a country that is pretty small, but they've been, uh, but, but the rationale for, 
closing down NGOs, which is either that they're not active or that there's some irregularity with their filing or their paperwork, et cetera, et cetera, has also provided the, uh, the rationale for closing down any NGO um, that has been critical of the regime. And this is particularly true of all that of a lot of NGOs that are affiliate that are um, feminists or that are affiliated with certain um, churches. So that now even solidarity activists may or may not be allowed to go back into the country. And you won't find that until you actually try to land there. People have been stuck in Panama because they can't make the last leg of the trip into Nicaragua and you have no way to know, um, except that at some point, you know, somebody made a criticism and it got back to the government and, uh, and you're not allowed in anymore. Um, the government now, because it has continued to change the laws, has the right to uh, put in jail or send to exile or deny nationality and citizenship to whomever they say is plotting against Nicaragua's quote, sovereignty and independence. And it is the government who defines what sovereignty and independence means and how they will use it. Um, you, as obviously you know what all this means for certainly for democratic practice and for uh, pluralism of thought within N Nicaragua that there, there is only one way of thinking in Nicaragua, and it is it's not even the FSLN thinking, it is Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo, and at some point you have to guess what they're thinking um, and not contradicted, which is the reason I think why, as Don says, uh, most people are afraid to speak, even people who are nominally in support just because it's so arbitrary that you just don't know whether you may be thinking at one point or another might end up um, being on the wrong side of whatever the presidential couple is, 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 is um, believing or wanting to care out at any moment in time. So you don't speak. Um, the last time I was in Nicaragua was in 2018, and, uh, the, uh, no, excuse me, 2018, yeah, that was before COVID. It was right before COVID in January. And um, all my Nicaraguan friends spoke in whispers as in, you know, you, ju you just don't know who's listening. Um, I, I, at first I used to think this was kind of like an exaggerated tendency, but then um, over time, I'm not so sure it's exaggerated at all um, because I do know that that family who has of friends who have family who work for the government in a very informal manner are forever now being told um, to you know, to watch out or to why you're still speaking to this person and kind of more like informal familiar kind of pressure to make sure that everybody uh, stays in line. On the second point on women um, losing quite a bit of ground systematically since uh, 2006, even though I know that the government touts a lot this the 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 truth that the that Nicaragua has one of the highest number of women um, in the um, in the Congress, and that's and and that is true. Um, but it is also true that all of those women have to be unconditionally faithful to to the FSLN and then from within the FSLN to the presidential couple. And that if at some point they decide for whatever reason that they um, they don't want to um, they don't want to vote the party line or they have other ideas, they are running the risk of not being. Um, of being kicked out of the party, which automatically means then being kicked, losing your job, et cetera, et cetera. I was just looking up this week, uh, right before in preparation for this, uh, that they've had a, um, the latest um, person who had to leave the country was a woman that was um, high level in the police force because she dissented from whatever policies were being implemented and she ended up losing her job. So she now is um, in the US. So that seems to be the option these days. 
descent means um, risking your job uh, and you know feeling like you have to go to exile um, in case you do get picked up and go to jail. Um, the 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 reproductive rights have pretty much ended for Nicaraguan women. This is not yet as draconian as let's say in El Salvador, where you know, with a, with a miscarriage can lead to 30 years in jail for the woman in question. Um, but abortion was one of those, was one of the first rights that went out the window with the rapprochement that the Ortegas had with the church right after 2006 and the shift from just like a revolutionary rhetorical position to a, a, a rhetoric that spoke of socialismo and cristianismo and uh, of, of, of the new presidential couple and the new version of the revolution being both um, Christian and revolutionary and the whole, um, I don't know, spectacle, if you want to use that language of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo getting married by the church and getting married by the arch, uh, by the cardinal as a way of announcing formally, you know, we turn a new leaf, we are, um, this is, Nicaraguan people are very Catholic, so so are we, and we are um, in complete agreement uh, with the church, and in order to gain that um, recognition, or maybe that alliance with the church, part of what had to go was reproductive rights. That has cha changed since 2000. Um, in 18, the Cardinal has not been the leading voice in the Catholic Church in opposition to the presidential couple that has been other people, um, all of whom have been um, in one way or another, uh, uh, not only the, has, has Daniel Ortega spoken strongly against them, but the, the clearest case is the case of the of the priest who was supposed to have been in that in that um, plane with the 300 and 200 and something at this 298 299 people that were in jail that they were put on a plane and then um, sent to uh, Washington DC overnight earlier in the year and he was not on it because he was under house arrest. So since he wasn't in jail, he didn't get to make it to the um, to the plane. Of all the people who have lost whose whose nationality and and, uh, and citizenship has been taken away, there are only two who remain in Nicaragua. One of them is the priest, and I'm blanking out on the name right now. He's um, from one of the churches in the north. And he continued to be under house arrest until about 10 days ago when he was taken from his home and is now officially in jail. Um, and the other one is of course, Vilma Nunez, uh, who was my boss while I, while I worked in Nicaragua, who led the, one of the human rights commissions um, for during the, during, the, uh, during the Sandista revolution and ever since she is officially a non-person uh, in Nicaragua, and we can talk about what that means for her personally later on. Um, but this, but but everybody else has had to go on, um, has either been expelled for the country, uh, other people have left in anticipation of getting um, picked up. The most visible feminist and lesbian activists uh, have been deported or they have left the country. So that whole feminist movement that was able to develop on its own once the um, uh, once the Sandinistas lost power in 1990 because um, Lai and the, and, the, and the official women's movement was so closely tied to the party that it could not act independently. It began to act independently after what was one of the most active movements um, in Nicaragua in the neoliberal years. And it has been a thorn on the side of, of Daniel Ortega since he got back into power in 2006. That has now pretty much officially been um, de decapitated. There is, of course, the continuing matter of, of Ortega having sexually abused his stepdaughter from the age of 11. 
uh, with total impunity because he is the president and, and he's totally protected by that. So uh, not, no charges, nothing can be um, brought up um, against them. So uh, that personal, but the personal conduct of, of the men who holds the presidency and then the, the policies that they have followed as they continue to figure out you know, how to hold on to power have, have diminished uh, women's rights and spaces uh, for women as the FSLN becomes more and more simply an instrument for the Ortega couple to remain in power. And the third thing that I just wanna talk a little bit is these, it is this, is it is, um, this interesting way in which the Ortegas have been, Ortega Maria have been ruling since 2016, because the rhetoric continues to be, um, if you look at it carefully, the, the, the rhetoric is anti-imperialist, very specifically anti-imperialist. It is no, it is not anti-capitalist at all. And there is good reason for that. Um, because since 2006, um, the, 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 it seems like what the government made an arrangement with the uh, right-wing sectors of, of Nicaragua, obviously the church, uh, but also the U.S. and definitely the Nicaraguan bourgeoisie, right? The, 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 the U.S. and the, the Ortega government had a very, very good relationship after 2006, in part because um, the government seems to have made a, a, an agreement with uh, Nicaraguan bourgeoisie that you can take care of export and the economy as long as you don't in get involved in the politics and you leave the politics to us. So as long as you don't uh, get involved with anything that has to do with the way in which we're going to conduct our affairs, uh, we won't touch you. And that is, in fact, what has happened. I mean, the, the, the Nicaraguan... Uh, bourgeoisie has flourished um, quite a bit from 2006 till now in terms of experts and ex exports, in terms of you know production, in terms of tax breaks, everything that they want, they have received. Right, the flourishing of of maquiladoras, um, et cetera, et cetera, and there has been no harsh rhetoric against them whatsoever. The harsh rhetoric is always maintained and designed and, and reserved against the U.S., even though there were quite, quite, um, uh, quietly so, quite a few agreements that the, that the Nicaraguans were able to enter on um, to get loans from the banks. And, and you know, the typical neoliberal regime um, that they needed to maintain, and that satisfied the U.S. There were um, there was even a point at which the the Nicaraguan military and the American military were doing doing joint exercises, and the Nicaraguans were collaborating uh, with the Americans, particularly about questions of the war on drugs. So the relationships were actually very good, despite the heated um, rhetoric until. Um, 2018. So the private sector has been protected um, altogether. And in fact, I mean, um, it's probably also well known in, in this group, you know, that, that the Ortegas and the Ortega Murillo clan um, um, joined them um, over the period of, of those 12 years to now become the sixth largest uh, fortune in, in the country. So there has never been a harsh word against the Nicaraguan landowners, the investors, or the merchants. Part of the reason why the Nicaraguans, why, why Ortega and Murillo were able to do this is because until mm, shortly before 2018, um, the government was able to, to dispense, or well, dispense is not the proper word, is to, um, to distribute. Uh, uh, um, not redistribute, but to distribute a little, uh, some of the wealth that the government itself um, was able to control because they had a slush fund that was coming out of Venezuela for the Nicaraguan government uh, for, for whatever it wanted to use. So that particular part, and that was not part of the regular budget. You know, the Nicaraguan government had a budget and it went through 
through the Congress, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to that, they had this other flow of money that was coming straight to Venezuela. And that is what the Ortega Morillo were using for supporting, you know, the poorest of the poor, for um, uh, for the programs that they were implementing, some of the social programs that were implemented towards the poor. So the poor, but, but Venezuela um, has only gotten worse in in the period of time that we're also talking about, and they were and they had to cut back the level of support that they were providing to the Nicaraguan government. And, at, and it is at that moment at which then the Nicaraguan government has to um, go into some further austerity measures. And uh, and that led to some of the protests started in, uh, in, 20, in 2018. And by austerity measures, uh, particularly like pensions and other um, kinds of social programs because the neoliberal program in and of itself um, has not changed at all. That that hasn't um, changed on the part of the Nicaraguan uh, government. Well, with the left, as 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 you know, the, the Ortega and Murillo knew the left, the Nicaraguan left very, very well because they were their former comrades, as, as, as Don said, they all knew each other. Uh, really well. And that is who began to, to bear the brunt of the political repression right after that in 2006. As Ortega and Miri, you began to decide who were the people who were not going to be unconditionally faithful to them, who were the people that could be potential, who that could be potential, um, that could be potential competition as well. And those people began to be um, peeled off uh, and uh, the the all of them are are either in exile or none of them have their jobs left um, anymore and that but the left is what continues to worry uh, I think Ortega uh, uh, what continues to worry both Ortega and Murillo so to close I just want I mean I want to just raise a few qu four questions for you to consider one of them is sort of if if the greens are going to have a position do you want to i think you need to consider whether you not only support but defend a man who was sexually assaulting um a child because the u.s government hates him right that is a consideration the, the personal behavior of of the guy who happens to be the president and this anti-imperialism and his rhetorical anti-imperialist position um, and the U.S. policy towards him enough to um, to 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 defend him despite his reprehensible personal behavior. Um, will the Greens support and defend the government um, that doesn't allow dissent again because the U.S. government hates him, right? And will and and I think um, the the the. Um, you have the, the thinking of a couple of multiple levels to do the thinking uh, where, where the Greens want to situate um, themselves. I think it is it is it is the, the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. government. That's the easy part is we'll take an anti-imperialist decision. But then what happens to the peoples of, of these areas that have to fear what to do with their own political systems? And uh, where do you support? where do you support them and not support them and then uh, what is the basis for making that decision thank you thank you Myrna uh, Diana are you ready hello Diana Bone we had her there I promise you, there she is. Diana, you need to get your mute off and you're on. I didn't realize I was muted. So this is a statement by the High Commissioner of the United Nations, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We have a growing concern that the authorities in Nicaragua are actively silencing any critical or dissenting voices in the country and are using the justice system to this end. In May alone, 63 people were reported to have been arbitrarily detained throughout the country. In a single night, 56 people were charged with conspiracy to undermine 
national integrity and spreading false news. Charges the government is apparently using to silence its critics. The United Na Nations Human Rights Committee already raised such concerns in 2022 during the review of, its, of Nicaragua. And here's a statement by the Committee for the Revolutionary International Regroupment. President Ortega has governed, governed Nicaragua in favor of the rich throughout the last 16 years in office. A former revolutionary, Ortega has been reelected three times since 2006, 2006, during his 2021 reelection, which was a complete farce. This was preceded by the 2018 massive state repression unleashed by the Ortega government that killed several hundred protesters and, and injured more than a thousand. Today in Nicaragua, there is no longer any labor, student, or political freedom. As socialists, we must raise our voices in protest against the person who today violates the democratic gains of the Sandinista revolution. Nicaragua's own ambassador to the Organization of American States called his country's government a dictatorship and resigned his post, stating that there are more than 177 political prisoners and more than 350 people have lost their lives in my country since 2018. To continue to remain silent and defend the indefensible is now impossible. And here's an article of part of an article from Havana Times, the decision of the Ortega regime to illegally confiscated assets and properties of 222 political prisoners expelled from Nicaragua on February 9th, 2023 is a legal barbarity that now affects 316 innocent citizens and extends a new message of insecurity for investors. A sentence of May 19th and released on June 19th, ordered the Attorney General's office to proceed with the confiscation of assets of 222 exiles, almost following the same script used by the 94 Nicaraguans who were declared stateless in February 15th. This robbery unparably damages the entire Nicaraguan legal establishment in matters of private part property. With the Ortega Murillo family in power, no one in Nicaragua is safe. Catholic Church, the message sends is that no Nicaraguan will be able to have peace of mind or guarantees of their assets. What Ortega has done is an unlawful barbarity that continues to increase the demolition of human rights in case, in this case, the right, right to property universally guaranteed by world human rights treaties and conventions. And here is a statement by families of political pris prisoners. Repression has, repression has deepened and widened. The number of political prisoners keeps increasing. The 235 plus prisoners now include family members of wanted activists detained when authorities can't find the person they're looking for. Family members of prisoners are also being harassed in silence, even those in exile for fear of reprisals against family members still in Nicaragua. More than 3,000 NGOs have been closed. Universities continue to be closed as well. The persecution of the Catholic Church has continued and intensified. So the Mayagna indigenous group of northern central Nicaragua has many problems. The advance of the agriculture frontier by mestizo invaders from the west has resulted in change in land use, external ground, demographic pressure on the Magnagna communities, which has generated damage to the communal heritage and inability of the Magna people to provide for themselves. I, I keep getting re requests from people, from, from that people, of Magna people, for, for money to help them get food because they're starving. The invaders have executed massive attacks since 2010 committing murders, burning villages, and forced displacement of communities. The massacres are increasing day by day. The government took away their arms, so they can't even hunt, whereas the invaders have machine guns. Despite many appeals for help from the government, there has never been a response. The Inter-American Court on Human Rights calls for the immediate release of four members of the Mayagna indigenous community people 
deprived of liberty in Nicaragua. That just came in today. The Nicaraguan friend, um, Tomasita Medal, who is watching this video, is on the, on the list here. Uh, she has re relatives in Nicaragua, and she told me that they reported that doctors who attended wounded people in 2018 were in prison and have been in prison ever since, and the prison, they have been tortured. These are two people that I know. One is Dr. Maria Luisa Costa, coordinator of legal assistance for indigenous people. She was participating in the first national dialogue with Ortega in April, 2018. And during that, the regime began to harass all the civil society members with whom they said they were going to dialogue. She was harassed to the point of fearing for her life and left Nicaragua, moved out of Nicaragua. She actually moved to El Salvador where her daughter and grandchildren are living, which is, is certainly not known to be a safe place. The other person I know is Circles Robinson. He worked for the Union of Ranchers and Farmers from 1986 to 1999. And in, in, uh, he founded the Bilingual Havana Times in 2008. He has edited this publication ever since. During the Ortega government violence of 2018, he chose exile instead of certain jail and or deportation. So those are things that I have found uh, that I think are really important to know about. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I think one could assume just listening to uh, the three of us talk that Nicaragua is a confusing and often contradictory place. Sometimes when we talk about it, we don't know where to begin. It's also an extremely divided place. Um, I'd say a good number of people support what's going on, good number of people oppose, and Nicaragua is also a multi-ethnic place. So there, there's native rights problems happening at the same time as there's linguistic problems happening. And then you just have the normal Latin American landowner, farmer, farm worker divide, which is as sharp in Nicaragua as it is anywhere else. And then you have the confusion of a government that used to be a revolutionary government, claims to still be a revolutionary government and holds the name. So we would like to open this up for conversation. Justin, are you gonna be our timekeeper? Yeah, I'll uh, help keep stack and uh, take time. Yeah, well, let's, why don't we like all be respectful with short questions and please, Justin, feel free to cut us off if we're taking too long to answer. Okay, great. Uh, since we've got a fair number of people I'll, at, at the beginning here, let's say we'll keep it to a minute each. Um, that includes the, the person from the audience uh, commenting as well as, uh, you know, each of our three panelists. And then we can circle back and hear from people again if, uh, you know, if we have time. So I'll largely take people in order. Go ahead and use the raise hand button. Um, you know, we may mix it up a little bit just to do a progressive stack as needed. Um, but I saw Bill Balderston jumped right in. So, so Bill, start with you, followed by Roger Harris. Um, Bill, uh, go ahead and unmute. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate <clears throat> all the presentations today and, and the interest of as I say, full disclosure, I am involved in a political tendency nationally and internationally that has been quite active in support uh, of those who lost their uh, nationality uh, uh, rights in Nicaragua and has had a, a, a strong tradition of <clears throat> solidarity with Nicaragua as well. I guess I, I'm not going to try to uh, go over so much was discussed. And I think it's, it would be an interesting discussion at some point to think about the periodization of this and the, for lack of a better term, the degeneration. Um, but I guess my, my question is this, how uh, do people see this in terms of the left currently both in this country and internationally, because there, there is a strong divide. Um, there's a, a call to the, uh, for example, uh, to the uh, Sao Paulo Forum 
uh, to take a stand on this. Um, how do people feel we can dialogue on this? Because on a range of, of issues, not the least of which is Ukraine, um, dialogue has become uh, very difficult. Uh, at a socialism, uh, con the socialism, I think it was 2020, uh, someone speaking on Nicaragua was harassed and physically threatened because he was critical. Um, uh, Bill, if he, you could wrap it up shortly. Yeah, uh, of the Ortega regime. So I guess my, short, my, my question is, you know, are we able to have a, 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 a longer discussion as to what lessons we draw from this? Thanks. Who would you like to answer that? Whomever. <laughs> you know, I think it relates to uh, okay. what all three speakers said. Well, I'll give it a 30 second try. Um, anything like this damages the left. Uh, when you have a government that um, gives us a bad name and is doing things that, uh, frankly, you know, just kind of are beyond the pale, um, everybody hears about it. And this is a gift to the right. The right wing is going to make sure we hear about it. Oh, did you hear that the Ortegas threw out 300 people, blah, 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 right? Now, they probably shoot that many people in a day in Yemen, but we're not going to hear that in the news. The news is going to exploit this. And it's hard. It's hard for the movement to like keep a, a clear head. The United States is extremely aggressive against certain countries, uh, especially Venezuela and Cuba. That aggression is not ethical or warranted or anything. Does it make uh, Venezuela or Cuba a democracy? And it doesn't make Nicaragua a democracy either. Thanks. Um, Diana or Mirna, would you like to respond to this? Thank you, Den Fine. You know, the, the question of how to have the conversation, um, I mean, besides having a forum like this, where you can at least um, air points of views, uh, those things are becoming rare, particularly in the US where the situation is so polarized. Um, but the the but there has to be some way to continue to try to put that as a discussion item on the table uh, on 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 whatever kind of you know form is available. I I don't have an answer um, to that more than to than say it has to happen. All right, great. Uh, let's go on to our next. Um... Uh, audience member Roger Harris, uh, go ahead and unmute. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you for putting on the forum. I think this is very helpful because I think we need to look for areas of commonality, areas to get together, think collective work. I, I, I'm, I'm, in terms of disclosure, I'm also with an organization called the Task Force on the Americas. We're a 39 year old human rights group, and we've long been involved in. Um, in solidarity with the Nicaraguan people. And what we learned was to be in solidarity with Nicaraguan people was to be opposed to US imperialism. That it's ever more urgent. Um, I mean, there's just new legislation today being um, considered um, making it more difficult. One of the speakers spoke about starvation in Nicaragua. That legislation is being designed to starve people in Nicaragua. So my, my question to the two companeras is, why did you not mention about US imperialism? I mean, I, I understand that, you know, we from privileged backgrounds- Wrap it up briefly. have our please. ideals, but why, we also have to get real, realistic of how we can oppose US imperialism and particularly how we can become give relief to the Venezuelan to the 
N Nicaraguan people. And my other question for the for Diana is that you did quote a number of sources that were for overthrow of the Cuban Revolution and the um, re and the um, Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela. Um, do you now believe that those revolutions also should be overthrown? And finally, my question for all three speakers is, what is the alternative? Um, do you want the Catholic Church in Nicaragua to be um, the feminist leadership? Please tell me. Um, I'll answer that very quickly. Um, I didn't talk, I didn't mention U.S. imperialism because I think everybody knows about U.S. imperialism. Uh, and I am assume I I am just assuming I'd be wrong that everybody in this group is against U.S. imperialism. That's a given in in a situation. I was more interested in trying to speak on in, of the internal dynamics that are happening in Nicaragua that may or may not be related to U.S. imperialism. And I think this is where we need to, um, as, as outsiders, think about this as a complex problem that, that happens on a variety of different levels. Um, yes, there is U.S. imperialism, but there are dynamics within Nicaragua that are, are in fact, independent of, of U.S. imperialism. And, and those are the ones that I have that I wanted to share some information that people may or, or may not have. And both of those uh, things can be true. Uh, and, and and yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, Nicaragua should be able to, to figure out what it is that they're going to do um, on their own. And ideally, I think as outsiders, we should be in favor of principled positions that say, um, just as we on principle oppose U.S. imperialism, we in principle also oppose um, internal dynamics that would repress the participation of, of, of people to shape their own destiny. So those two are not contradictory as the way I see it. Yeah, I agree with Nick, with Myrna, that we certainly know about US imperialism. Our country's probably the worst, maybe not quite the worst in the world, but it's pretty bad in its policies. And I certainly don't, I, 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 suggests the overthrow of Venezuela's government, et cetera. And US imperialism is, is really bad. Can I say a word here? Um, you know, as Americans, we sometimes absorb a little too much of our base culture. And one of the things we absorb from our base culture is telling ourselves that we have a right to judge. We don't need to talk about what the alternatives in Nicaragua should be any more than we oppose what's happening in Palestine and Israel's mistreatment of the Palestinian people. That doesn't mean we support Fatah or don't support Fatah or we're like Hamas or anything like that. It simply means that we're, we have to see and analyze things as they are. And it is a bad situation that a government that once really held the flag of progress and whatnot in the Americas is now turning to be turning out to be fairly repressive. Um, and I think that we should be clear about what that repression is. And we should, you know, offer the solidarity with peoples. I think that we have to stop becoming part of the American gaze, which says we get to judge what government they should have. We should not get to judge what government they should have. It's their business. And when it comes to talking about imperialism, that's what we need to tell our own government. It's their business. Get the hell out of these other countries' internal affairs. And I think we should practice what we preach. Great. Whoever's next. Next up, um, Jill, go ahead and unmute. Oh, okay. I'm just surprised that I'm going when there are three people ahead of me in line. But if we, that's it. We were going to do a you know progressive stack where you're the first uh, woman we've had actually from the audience speaking. Oh, so, oh, I got that, you. That's, that's okay, all. thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, hi, I'm uh, Jill, and I'm uh, in the Green Party in Maryland. And uh, Phoebe invited uh, me to this because we met in Nicaragua in January when we were on the delegation looking at women's rights. And I, I really don't know where to start with all of this, but um, I would say that uh, Mirna has done an excellent job 
of presenting to us the position of the MRS party, which is now called UNAMOS, and which I believe at their height got about 6% of the vote in Nicaragua. I'm, I'm not going to go into um, some of the inaccuracies that she mentioned, but I just I want to say as as a, a, a Green Party voter and as somebody who is really um, trying to uh, bring about um, a more peaceful world and the better world that so many people in the global south are striving for and people in this country. I have to come to realize that um, we, as it, it's odd, um, Don was using these words, but in a in a context that's really hard for me to grasp. But we have to let the people of Nicaragua have the kind of government that they want. And I have you know, my my mother is Nicaraguan. You know, my my connection to Nicaragua goes back sixty one years. I have family there, I have friends there, I visit a lot, and I have not met a Nicaraguan that doesn't have criticisms of their government. I haven't met anyone in the United States that doesn't have criticisms of their government. And people express these criticisms. Uh, but, really um, excuse me? A few more, few more seconds. Uh, well, I just wanna know whether Don and Mirna, well, I, I wanna say that, um, when people from the MRS party and that ilk say that the the, the uh, women in parliament are only Danielle Ortega's stooges and that women have no rights, and I've talked to peasant women who advocate for abortion rights and who have better access to some of the medications that we have here, like the, the morning after pill, and who have made great strides and who get graduate degree after graduate degree and who are, you know, changing their society, they're getting, they're changing the way families work and their um, more acceptance of LGBT rights, all this wonderful stuff that is happening. If you go into communities, if you don't talk to wealthy English speaking people educated abroad, which is what the MRS party is, it's Jill, really a, a small segment of population. Please. And um, I just want to know, uh, you know, if if Don and um, and Diana and Mirna have gone into poor communities and seen how people live and heard about the changes. I mean, talking about that this is a neoliberal government, it seems that you would not bend to see how real Nicaraguans live and how it's changed between the actual neoliberal years and since 2007. Okay, thank you. Well, I can say that just today the people of the Mayagna people have pleaded for more money because they cannot, they're starving and they cannot raise the food that because of the, the invasion by the people from the West, they they just sent a, a urgent plea, urgent, they said, for, for money to buy food. This is, I have a teach class on this and we spend the whole semester talking about some of this. So let me see if I can distill it to 30 seconds. Um, insofar as, this can go back to the, to the real revolution of, of 79 to 90. Insofar as the Nicaraguan government um, takes a approach of being supportive of the lower classes, women will benefit because the majority of women in Nicaragua are in the lower classes, right? So it depends on whether you look at a class approach or whether you look at a, you look at a, at a gender approach. So from a class approach, whatever the lower classes got, women got 50% of it, absolutely positively, they did. Um, um, whether that was structural, change or not or whether that was wholly tied to what i was talking about which is this 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 flexibility that the government had to play with for a while because they had this this slush fund where they could provide some level of support to the poorest of the poor uh, of nicaragua was a different question when we're talking about taking a gender approach to 
the society in supporting questions that are specifically related to gender, then the government doesn't look so good. I mean, again, started with the fact that the president is a rapist. Uh, and then moving on to whether or not women who raise certain issues about violence against women, against about femicide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, all kinds of other access, that will depend on the mood of what is happening at the very high levels of position within um, the Nicaraguan government. And that has not been consistent. Um, the, the on on you know on a on, on a great variety of levels. Um, I'd like to say two words here. Uh, the last time the group other group presented, uh, they had all been on some tour, and uh, I was disappointed at the time that there were attacks on us as people for having different opinions than the ones they wanted us to have. And Jill, uh, you don't know me, so please don't make uh, assumptions about my background or anything like that. Um, frankly, I was in the Nicaraguan army for three years. I don't know if you were. I worked in the Nicaragua countryside for five years. I don't know if you did. I have maintained relations with people in the countryside for 40 years. I don't know if I really want to be listening to a lecture about what it's like in rural Nicaragua. Um, I will say that I was there in 2018. And we can talk about all the analysis you want to see, but I saw the attacks. I saw people taking iron bars out of cars and attacking protesters. I saw people being shot at. And it was a very confusing situation. And we got into a car and we drove out to Sebaco. And uh, it was like there was no situation going on at all. It was like Monago was one thing and Sebaco was another and Batagalpa was yet a third. And to categorize what's going on in Nicaragua with any sweeping statements, I think is um, too simple. And frankly, we do need to understand, same reason we do understand in other people. And I talk about Israel all the time. The way the Israelis treat the Palestinians is not acceptable. We know that it's true. So why should we turn around and say putting people in prison for their political ideas, attacking protesters with uh, violence is OK? It's not OK. Now, I don't know how we're going to heal this, but being in denial about it or trying to find quick talking points or cleverly trying to equate somebody's quote as meaning they therefore support something else, that's not going to do it. That's not going to convince anybody. And it's certainly not going to bring any resolution within our movement here in the United States, the one we have to worry about. Uh, our divisions among ourselves is going to lead to us being ineffective. We need to maintain our credibility as a left in order to say, hey, you know, there are principles involved that our government does not follow, but we act, we actively advocate. And when I say that I'm an anti-imperialist, I say that I'm against intervention, attacking me and trying to tell me that I'm really like really contradictory or something, that's not leading us to some kind of unity that's gonna help us be effective. Um, and I really do, uh, and I see a couple people in line, save the personal attacks, right? Just we have our opinions, let's treat each other with respect and uh, let's listen to each other, not just say, oh, you were, you know, somehow disqualified from your opinions because of your race, because of your ethnic background. If you think I'm like some rich person from the United States that went to a fine school, you really don't know me. And I do not appreciate that kind of thing being said. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, John Perry. Let's take two audience members back to back here and one minute each, please. Uh, John Perry, followed by uh, Eric Marr. Go ahead, John. Uh, what's disturbing me about the discussion is the fact that we're, um, it's the fact that we're not really looking at the context. I mean, Don, you began to do that, but you you didn't say that the the opposition were tremendously violent in April, May, June, July. 
2018. I live in Masai, I've been here for 20 years. And here five uh, police officers were killed. Uh, one was killed after severe torture. Several of my friends were kidnapped and tortured. One still has uh, uh, problems because he was severely beaten up. And the other lost his arm because his arm was smashed to pieces because they were trying to get him to confess where the mayor lived because they wanted to go and kill the mayor. And the mayor was in hiding. And in Masai, the town hall, the main secondary school, the tourist market, which is very important for Masai's economy. 15 were seconds. Down. Many, many houses were burnt down, uh, owned by Sandinistas. And, you know, it was very, very difficult living here for three months because there were armed groups controlling the city. And they weren't just armed with stones and homemade mortars. They were at the very beginning, but they very quickly had conventional arms. And we also ought to remember that all of these people were the subject of, many of them were arrested in July 2018 and afterwards. But then there was an amnesty in 2019 when they were all released. Every one of those people who is now in the States was released if they were in prison in 2019. John, wrap it up, uh, please. I, uh, my wife was threatened by at a roadblock by someone with an AK-47. We walked past him on the road the other day. Uh, you know, he's been released. And you have to understand, I mean, if you want to understand Nicaraguan people's attitude towards what happened and towards what's happening now, you have to really appreciate how they suffered this violence in, in 2018 and that the way it's been portrayed in the international press is completely wrong. Uh, John, we're going to have to move on so we can hear from uh, all the people who have hands raised. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, Eric Marr, go ahead. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, what, uh, especially like uh, Don has been saying, um, also Mirna, um, and I also appreciate what um, the Nikonet uh, people like John and um, Jill Clark Golub have um, been saying. I hear both sides from people that I know in Nicaragua. Um, but I think something that Don said that's uh, relevant is that it's not really up to us to decide. Um, so I, I have two uh, related questions. One is, as the Green Party, what specifically does support or non-support mean? Do we support the sanctions, for example, against individuals which are known not to work? Um, and in at least two cases that I know specifically of were based on virtually zero evidence um, that, and, and they're completely kind of arbitrary, they're sort of political theater, they're very unfair, and they introduce a climate that chills um, international donation, investment, all these things that have very real material effects on the population in Nicaragua. So is the Green Party saying that we are supporting the sanctions um, on individuals? Yeah. Is the Green Party saying that we should support the U.S. breaking the CAFTA deal with Nicaragua? Um, what specifically does withdrawing support mean? A related question then is, if you would like to support um, the kind of change that you would like to see in Nicaragua, who are the agents of that change? Um, is it the Liberal Party? Is it UNAMOS? Is it the, the base of the Militancia Feminista, who also, I know for a fact, um, up, are asking please. a lot of the same questions that we're all asking. Um, yes, they're disciplined. Yes, they will always support um, the leadership, but they're not a bunch of robots. They're asking a lot of these same questions. So who is the base? Who, who is the agent for social change that we think that you know, should be supported? Thanks. Great, thanks so much. And uh, if you joined us late, everyone, um, you know, just to let you know, the Green Party doesn't have an official position per se on Nicaragua. And so this this whole presentation is um, for information and education, just as the, the previous one we had a few months ago in, in that same spirit. So, um, you know, we're, we're working towards something here. Um, and so over to, uh, go ahead, Don. Um, well, first, what John said about uh, the situation in uh, in Messiah, I believe is true. He is not the only person that said that for him there. I know people in Messiah. Um, and what I said before, when I said it was, I was traveling around Nicaragua during the, these protests, and every part of Nicaragua felt like a different country. 
And Nicaragua is a confusing place. All that said, I think Eric brings us to the point. Um, what is the Green Party position? The truth is, Eric, we don't have one yet. These are the conversations by which we would choose one. I personally am opposed to all of the sanctions. I'm opposed to all the interference. I'm opposed to all the pressure on the Nicaraguan government, period, uh, from our government and from the international institutions that our government control. That said, there's nothing that stops us as uh, individuals to speak up. Uh, and there was a campaign to try to get these people out, the political prisoners out. Now they were all expelled from their country. Um, and I don't know how to deal with that, frankly. I'm looking for ideas. And that's part of why we hold these forums. These are the processes by which we can flush things out. And if you're not like belligerently on one side or the other, refusing to face certain uncomfortable facts, I think we could come up with things to do. But in the end, who is going to change Nicaragua? I don't know. It's up to them. Uh, the only thing that I see as a shining uh, light is that many of the people that I talk to who consider themselves opposition have ruled out the armed struggle. And I think that is a good thing. And I, I can't name the number of people that said, you know, they've done the armed struggle, right? They don't want to ever see their country go through that again. And that's a message that we should listen to. Uh, but as far as who is going to run the new Nicaragua or when or how we're going to get there, that's really something. If you care that much about it, move there. Okay. Diana or Myrna? I have nothing to add. Um, I, I mean, I'm not a green, so I'm not in, in, involved in whatever internal politics are going on. Um, I have a very specific analysis of, of 2018 in, in, in Masaya, in, uh, which is probably more than what we want to get into here. Um, but I, I would agree that, uh, yeah, I don't mean Nicaraguans who will decide um, what's going to happen uh, with their with their country, right? Uh, and I guess we'll be finding out uh, fairly soon. But it, it, but I do feel it's 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 not looking good when you decide that anybody who opposes you, you're just going to put them in jail. That's not a good sign, in, in in any society whatsoever. And 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 that is what's seriously happening um, in uh, in Nicaragua today. And granted, a lot of those people who were serious, you know, who who, who were opposing the government are not my favorite people. I mean, I think Cristiana Chamorro probably would have won, and 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 uh, and um, uh, I would not have voted for her myself. Uh, but I think the the government is making all those all those um, calculations. Um, so yeah, it's it'll be up to you, but I want some one way or another. Great. We'll take two more audience members back to back. Um, Tomasita Medal, go ahead, followed by Susan. Thank you. Um, I'm 100% Nicaraguan, born here in this, um, but um, my cousins um, were in the uh, Sandinista army and uh, one of them is on the Supreme Court and um, as a Sandinista representative. And um, I just want to try to get this message across. The, the Ortega government of today is not the same Sandinista government uh, as the first government. The first government was pure spirited, idealistic, honorable um, people who had put their lives on the line to get rid of Somoza. Um, Dan, uh, Carlos Fonseca, one of the founders of the Frente Sandinista Nacional had given the order, he sensed, he smelled a rat. He, he knew that um, the Fonseca, I mean the um, Ortega brothers were corrupt and he gave the order for them to be executed, but the other Frente members did not follow through with that. Uh, Carlos Fonseca could foresee what Daniel Ortega would do down the line, and sure enough, he has turned out to be what Carlos Fonseca thought he would be. Ten now, seconds. Um, my, okay, um, if you're interested in helping the Mayagna people, I've been working with Diana about it, but you could either contact her or I'll put my email in the address and please know that um, the 1492 is happening again in Nicaragua right now. 
and uh, look for the film Patrulla. And there's a there's a uh, and it talks about the same issue, but what's happening in the southern part of uh, Nicaragua's Atlantic coast to the indigenous people there. But it's the same as what's happening in Mayagna, and it's it's coming out. There's a there's a, um, a, a what I really was called the little film the case okay, trailer for it. Uh, on you can get it at Patrol. Uh, dot com or patrulla p a t r u l l a and look for that because that that does a better job of explaining what's happening on the Atlantic coast to indigenous people. Thank you. Thanks, Tomasita. Feel free to put that in the chat for people. Um, and then uh, Susan Lagos, go ahead. You're next. Susan, go ahead and unmute. Susan, are you there? Um, I, I can't. I saw you unmuted, Susan, but I can't hear anything. Um, and maybe your your image. I can't tell if I see a photo or an image there, but it doesn't. I'm not hearing anything. Um, let's go on to the next person, um, Barbara Larcom. Go ahead, and then we'll have to come back to you, Susan. I'm sorry. Hi, uh, I'm Barbara Larkham, and I am the coordinator of Casa Baltimore Limay, which is a sister city project in the north of Nicaragua, San Juan de Limay and Esteli region. Um, and I also, when I lived in Baltimore for 42 years, I was a green uh, member for at least uh, 20 of those years. I live in Ohio now and don't have that chance anymore. Um, so, but I understand what greens are all about, I think, and I support many of the issues. Um, I want mainly to question several things in terms of the factuality of them uh, that have been stated here tonight. So I'm just going to pose these um, as things that I question the facts of, and I have had a different experience. Mirna said that uh, Nicaragua is a one-party state. I was there in November 2021, and I observed that there were uh, at least six national parties that were vying for the presidential elections. Uh, Mirna also said that only 30% of the country supports the Ortega Murillo, Murillo uh, administration. In fact, about 70% of the people voted for them in that election. And there was an excellent turnout. I think it was over 60%, something like that. Uh, John Perry would probably have the exact figure, but anyway. 10 seconds. Uh, Mirna Myrna also said that uh, the administration is neoliberal. I have not found that to be the case. Poverty has been cut in half because of the programs that, that have been implemented in the country. They're giving away thousands of houses every year. They have a small loan program called Adelante. They've built 24 new hospitals. Unlike the previous time during the real neoliberal period, they have free health care and free education all the way through grad school. And in terms of the feminist approach, again, there is a feminist approach. They have implemented women's police stations that handle specific problems of domestic violence, and they have courts for that also. I see a lot of good that's happening in Nicaragua. And I think we need to be careful when we look at the facts, not to be too sweeping in the generalizations, as, as Don said earlier. Thank you. Thank you. OK, panelists, uh, who would like to respond to this in the previous? Go ahead. Well, I, I think it's a general, you know, um, like I say, one of the things that I think everybody who is a serious uh, observer of Nicaragua is going to tell you is that it's a very contradictory place. Um, it's also obviously very divided. Um, the exact numbers, I think Mirna's numbers have some more backing. Um, that last election and their numbers, uh, there's some serious problems with them. But all said, I know people, personal friends of mine, who are very pro Sandinista. And they have reasons to be pro Sandinista. They have paved roads that they didn't used to have. They have electricity that they didn't used to have. They have benefits, right? And they were one of they lived in one of the places where the liberal thugs started those uh, roadblocks that caused a lot of the backlash. Okay, so that's true. I can believe it. These are people I've known for a long time. 
But I've also known other people around the country in other places, people that were in the military with me, people who I know to be longstanding Sandinistas and revolutionaries um, and whose opinion I respect. And they're afraid to speak. And these are people who fought in the original wars, who fought the Contras, and that's where I knew them, who went on to try to build the Frente's new government and new, new society, and then went into, uh, re, what would you call it, into opposition during the UNO period. And, you know, it, it's just too consistent. The consistent message that I hear is you are no longer free to have your own opinion in Nicaragua. That's the bottom line. And, you know, yes, there are programs that are quite successful. Yes, there's a lot of things that you point to. They do not justify putting people into prison cells and beating them for having a different opinion. And, you know, yes, those things happened in uh, Esteli. They happened in... Uh, uh, what do you call it, Messiah. They also happened in El Qua, where I used to live. But those were not the actions of a government. Those were the actions of a completely disorganized opposition, and some of it was being manipulated by uh, an extreme right wing. And Nicaragua has its extreme right wing, just like we do. The idiots that tried to take over our Capitol building, they have their equivalent in Nicaragua. And you can imagine that everybody in Nicaragua right now is active and going around in different directions. But, you know, when I say don't sweep with a brush, you cannot say that one opposition group did something and therefore that defines the opposition any more than you can say everything that happens that the government does, you know, that's good, therefore erases the fact that they have become a repressive government. Thanks. Mirna, you want to say something? Or Diana? No. I mean, I, I um, when you look at these things structurally, this 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 reminded me of, of the situation um, of Mexico when the party, when the PRI was in power. Um, my some of my Nicaraguan friends who were uh, Sandinistas who still see themselves as Sandinistas, but not Danielistas. Uh, we talk about how the Mexican government um, in the 80s would advise the Sandinista government that they should, that the Frente should pattern itself after the PRI so that you have effectively one party rule that you can point to a whole bunch of different parties and say, we're not a one party system. Um, and at the time, certainly the friends that would talk to me about this felt that obviously the PRI was not a revolutionary government and it was not a revolutionary party, so they were not about to pattern themselves after the PRI. But uh, Barbara's comment reminded me of that. Sure, there were a number of different parties um, uh, present in, in Nicaragua, but really, there it is a one uh, party um, state. Yeah, it's and, a public party You can see system. how this stuff begins to move in that direction, because in order to be able to win that election, uh, the Sandinistas, again, because they had control of the Congress, drop the voting age to 16. I may not be against dropping the voting age to 16, you know, in, in general, but if you take all of the things that they've been doing systematically, and I forget who it is that said it would be really cool to look at this chronologically, and I'm not prepared to do that, but I agree that that is, that, that, that is where you can see how the party is operating to be able to take control of mostly um, all the different sectors of, of, of the state. The only other thing that I do want to mention in, in terms of the 2018 that is also really concerning was the use of paramil paramilitary forces on the part of the state because that was a new development. Um, the, the army was not uh, was involved to a certain degree, but the specific use of the paramilitary paramilitary forces, that are, I, I assume at this point that they are completely um, controlled by the uh, by uh, straight down uh, up to Daniel Ortega. Um, it also tells us something about institutions and the way in which Daniel has gained total control of institutions, and uh, and that has to be worrying 
for anybody that cares about institutions and just democracy in general. Uh, thanks, Mirna. Well, we are just, a, just about at 6.30. Um, there are three hands raised. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone. Um, if there's any comment you want to put in the chat uh, as, as we're wrapping up, um, please do. Um, so I'll turn it over to our uh, Don or our presenters to kind of give a final wrap up and um, yeah, go, go ahead, Don. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody that has come here and spoken up, including or maybe even especially the people who are challenging the view that we've put forward here. Um, we should always have an open discussion here. And like Barbara, you are actually challenging what we think are the facts. Those are important conversations. Because if we disagree on the analysis, that's one thing. If we disagree on the facts, it's another. And it's worth knowing. Just like we try to know what we know about what's going on in Yemen or Palestine or anywhere else where it's incumbent on progressives to have an understanding of the situation and to have an opinion. Now, having an opinion isn't saying we're going to interfere in their affairs, right? Uh, we've already seen in Libya the absolute disaster that happens when Westerners decide that they're going to run another somebody else's country. Uh, probably has a lot to do with what happened in Afghanistan, too. Nicaragua's small potatoes compared to that, but um, for the longest of times, it has been the place where Americans meddle. When I lived in Nicaragua, I lived in Nicaragua a long time. I was considered like one of the, the people that never go home. Um, well, partly because I didn't have one. Um, I, saw, I met a lot of Americans there. Um, it was amazing how many of us were able to go there and see what they wanted to see. They just, you know, and they would come and visit my project. And the ones who were like, you know, Christians and wanted to see, uh, what was it called? The, um, the left church, liberation theology. They wanted to see liberation theology, they saw liberation theology. If they wanted to see us living under a, a dark cloud of communist oppression, they saw that. And frankly, Nicaragua was neither of those things. And uh, I think we should all check our opinions at the gate. And I'll start with myself. I have some strong opinions about what's happening there right now, it's based on who I know, what I know. Uh, doesn't mean that we're actually able to do a survey there or to figure out what public opinion is. Um, and I don't think we should be claiming too much. And at this point, I really feel that we should go back to some of the basics that Eric was talking about. You know, do we support sanctions? No, right? Do we support the violation of human rights? Forget about whether or not we think Danielle is doing that. Do we, do we oppose the violation of human rights in other countries? And the answer is yes. So we need to know at least who our friends are. And we need to know who is on this journey with us towards civil rights. And as a Green Party, we have to be very careful uh, who we think we support and endorse and what it is we feel like we can explain away and ignore. And for me, the situation for civil rights in Nicaragua has become too big to ignore. All right, uh, Mirna, Dan. I mean, the only thing that I would say, sorry, Dan, go ahead. Diana, you're first. No, I, I agree. <laughs> Any more? <laughs> I mean, I think the only, the only thing that I would say is, you know, um, again, because, I have friends that are on, on a variety of different sides of, of, of this issue, including people who were Americans who were in Nicaragua in the 80s who feel that that really there is nobody else in Nicaragua that can rule Nicaragua except the FSLN. And I just don't think that's true. Um, I think all Nicaraguans deserve the same political standards um, that we would like for ourselves, you know, the same rights, the same obligations. Um, the same responsibilities, including accountability from their government, independently of how the U.S. government feels about them. Uh, would we want to be in ourselves, 
in a position where our nationality gets taken away because we, you know, we hated Trump or whatever. Would we want to be in, in, a, in, in, in a situation in which, um, you know, our families are, are worried about what they may or may not say at work because there may be uh, repercussions? Uh, are we would we want to be in in a situation in which um, you know you are you are afraid um, to speak, right? Those are the kinds of things I think when we're talking about politics is that we do have to pay attention to the minorities. Yeah, maybe Nicaraguans. Some there, there's a bunch of Nicaraguans that really really are benefiting from from this government and they're totally love it and they're in love with it. But in every single case, we got to pay attention to our political minorities. I want to pay attention to our political minorities in this country. I want to pay attention to political minorities uh, in Nicaragua. And I think as a Green Party, what I would say is that would you, as the Green Party today, as you think about uh, your position, as you think about if you were in power, would you run the country the way Daniel Ortega and uh, Rosario Murillo are running the country now? Would you? follow them as an example? Do you find that their policies, do you find that the way in which they're dealing with the politics, the way they're dealing with the economics, that will be something that you would want to follow? And that's um, what you have to think about. But I thank you for the opportunity to um, talk about something that I could talk about for days. 